Boys and girls, and welcome to Shock Theater. <laughs> today is a very special episode of Shock Theater because today we are going to celebrate everyone's favorite spooky holiday, Halloween. <laughs> and to get into the spirit, our fiends Igor and Kogar have been working on their own special Halloween decorations. Let's see how they're doing. <laughs> Kogar, you crazy monkey, are you finished already? Well, let's see it. Oh, all right. Uh, Igor, mm. he wants you to go first. Uh, not ready yet. Uh. What? That's wonderful. Happy Halloween. Thank you very much, Kogar. Happy Halloween to you. That's, that's very good. <laughs> all right, Igor, it's, it's your turn. Uh, still not ready. Uh. Uh. That's good, Igor. Uh, Igor, make it real good. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on, shall we? Say, Kogar, do we have a lucky letter this week? Hmm. Dear Dr. Shocker, <laughs> thanks for all the scary movies. My friend John Lamana bet me that you wouldn't read my letter on TV. If you do, he has to eat a worm. Your fan, Scotty Brunel. <laughs> well, Scotty, this is your lucky day, but not so lucky for your friend John, no. Because while he's busy choking down a nightcrawler, you are going to be enjoying the special prize we here at Shock Theater send you. Igor, what is today's special prize? Ta-da! Wonderful, how about that, Scotty? You and your very own Don Post mask. So remember, boys and girls, keep those cards and letters coming, because if I read yours on the air, you can win any one of these wonderful prizes! Time for show! Oh, that's right, Igor. It is time for the show. Very good, Igor. Let's go see what today's special presentation is going to be. Thank you, Kogar. Thank you very much. Drum roll, please. Halloween, the happy haunting of America. Sounds spooky. Spooky! Ha ha ha! So, boys and girls, pull up your favorite toadstool and prepare yourself for Halloween, the happy haunting of America! <laughs> We're at Universal City Walk. This extraordinary place is located right on top of the world-famous Universal Studios Hollywood. It was right here that Frankenstein, Dracula, and the Wolfman were born. Hi, I'm Daniel Roebuck, and it was those wonderful monster movies of the 30s and 40s that scared and thrilled me so much as a child and sent me on a lifelong quest to find the things that go bump in the night. I can't think of a better time of year to do that than Halloween. Come with us as we travel the country looking for the best and the scariest America has to offer. Along the way, we'll be joined by Halloween expert Bob Burns, as well as some very special tricks and treats. So sit back, try to relax, and enjoy Halloween, the happy haunting of America. Founded by Carl Lemley in 1915, Universal Studios officially entered into its classic horror cycle with the unmasking of Lon Chaney's Phantom of the Opera in 1925. A few years later, the studio hired Hungarian actor Bela Lugosi to recreate his Broadway triumph as the blood-sucking Count in Dracula, one of the studio's biggest hits of 1931. With the success of Dracula, Universal immediately turned to another famous horror novel, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Director James Whale chose English actor Boris Karloff for the part of the monster. But it was makeup artist Jack Pierce who gave that monster a face. 
Pierce turned the mild-mannered Karloff into a creation which has terrified millions over the years and permanently etched itself into our American psyche. Proving to be an even bigger hit than Dracula, Frankenstein launched a chain of sequels. First came The Bride of Frankenstein in 1935, then The Son of Frankenstein in 1939. Karloff relinquished the role to Lon Chaney Jr. for The Ghost of Frankenstein, then Bela Lugosi took over in Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. Finally, cowboy actor Glenn Strange was hand-picked by Jack Pierce to play the monster in House of Frankenstein and two other films. Along with the Frankenstein saga, Universal Studios also terrified us with The Mummy, The Wolfman, The Mole People, and The Creature from the Black Lagoon. Our journey begins right here at Universal City Walk in the Chamber of Chills. Universal Studios has teamed up with Ron Howard's Imagine Entertainment and Spencer Gifts and built 11 of these haunted houses around the country. Are you ready? <laughs> All right, come on with you. Let's go this way. Step into the chamber, please. First of all, I'd like to welcome you inside the chamber. Beyond that curtain, I didn't even like to think about it. All kinds of grizzlies and beasties back there. Each room has been especially designed to scare you to death. <laughs> oh, the worst is yet to come. Of course, Halloween has been around long before there was trick-or-treating, parades, or haunted houses. Halloween was one of my favorite holidays, uh, simply because of the, the aura, the atmosphere, uh, all the uh, trappings of Halloween. Uh, what, what's interesting to me as an Englishman coming to America in October is uh, um, that a lot of the traditions that are part and parcel of Halloween here now actually originated from England. The celebration of Halloween dates back more than 2,500 years. Its roots stem from a society of farmers and gatherers called the Celts, who lived mostly in northern England, Wales, Ireland, and Scotland. October 31st always coincided with the end of the harvest season for these people, which for them meant the end of the year. So like we do now, they'd have these incredible parties and feasts, and they'd dress in extremely elaborate costumes. Uh, I think at one point, the pumpkin came from it was originally a kind of a turnip or a squash that was carved with a candle put in it. That's, how they use, that's what they used them for. The, 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 the extras, when they called the fields for lanterns, they used them. Or they would put them around on a, on, a, on a rockway that was muddy or something like that. And then when the pilgrims got to America and the Indians taught them how to plant seeds for pumpkins, which because pumpkins were indigenous to, to, to America, to the colonies, they began to use the extra pumpkins for lanterns and then jack-o'-lanterns. At, during that harvest festival you're talking about. One of the key elements to this holiday back then was that these people were extremely superstitious and believed that at that point, when one year ended and another began, there would be a mysterious veil or separation between life and death and past and present that would be lifted, allowing the spirits of these people's ancestors to join them for a brief time. <laughs> So, Bob, how are you enjoying the Halloween trip so far? I love it. Huh. Well, tonight we're in Chatfield, Ohio, at the Horror Hotel. This is one of my favorite haunted houses. I come here every year. Dr. Lady puts this on. You've been here before. What do you think of this place? It's like doing a video with Scooby-Doo. I'm going inside. 
The origins of trick-or-treating in the United States actually began around the turn of the century in the northeastern part of the country. At that time, Halloween had developed the reputation for being a, a rambunctious holiday where kids would dress up and play tricks on neighbors like soaping windows and tipping over outhouses. It became so bad that adults came up with the idea of giving the kids treats as a form of bribery to, uh, to keep them from wreaking havoc on their property. It only took about 10 years after that for the youth of America to discover the concept of free candy, and the custom swept the entire nation. It's, it was a, a, an exercise in greed. You know, nobody cared really what you wore or anything like that. It was how many bags of candy could you actually get. And I remember literally three or four shopping bags full of candy. You know, a, and we'd have to go home, dump it, and come back and go. And it was really just uh, pure greed. You made your own fun in those days. Trick-or-treating was chancy because a lot of people really couldn't afford to give you anything. You might luck out and get a cookie from some lady who had just baked or perhaps a withered old Jonathan apple or a wine sap. Maybe uh, one of those candies that you got 10 for a penny. You might get one, but not the not the bags of candy that I, I hand through my door each Halloween. I remember going into the so-called rich neighborhoods because they had the caramel-covered uh, candy, candy apples and, uh, and better desserts that they would give you. They would give you, I think, the first time I'd ever seen those packaged little chocolate puddings, which I'm still addicted to. On Halloween, back when we used to film Bewitched, every year I would go trick-or-treating with Elizabeth Montgomery and her kids, Billy and Robert and Rebecca, and we'd all go trick-or-treating together through my neighborhood, and it was a lot of fun. And Halloween is still one of my favorite holidays. In those days, you could go out for hours, and your parents really didn't have to worry about you too much. You know, it was a more innocent time. Halloween was Halloween, and it was no big deal. The right mask is one of the most important choices you make during the Halloween season. But do you want to be scary? Oh! Or funny? Or cool? <laughs> or just plain weird. Here at Don Post Studios in North Hollywood, California, these artists continue a tradition started by the company founder over 50 years ago. Don Post Sr. started making masks in the late 1930s. His first line of masks lampooned the world leaders of the pre-war era, and soon he offered everything from clowns to animals. Then in the late 1940s, Don Post made a business decision that would make monster fans happy for years to come. He got a uh, uh, license to make a Frankenstein mask with Universal Studios way back about 1948. The first rubber mask I ever got was from Don Post Studios. I happened to know Don Sr. pretty well when I was a kid. And in 1948, I think I was 13 years old, he did the first Frankenstein mask in rubber. And it looked like Glenn Strange from Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. And I wanted one of those so bad. And I went to his place, and he was out of them. And, he said, and I, was, I was heartbroken. He said, all right, here's what you do. He wrote a note out, and it says, Bruce's Haunted House in Glendale. Now, I live in Burbank. We'll probably have them. Take this note and show them. I said, okay. I got there. 
I presented the note to the guy. He looked at it, and what Don had done is said, just give Bob one of these free. It was my first free mask. It was wonderful. I was so excited that day. I put that mask on, and I rode all the way home on my bicycle from Glendale to Burbank with that Frankenstein, that green Frankenstein mask on. It was one of the biggest thrills I ever had in my life, and that was my first Halloween Frankenstein mask I ever had. Don Poe's talents eventually led to Hollywood knocking on his door. Probably the most noted horror movie he worked on was The Body Snatchers. And uh, he also did a lot of uh, TV effects for Alfred Hitchcock and uh, all sorts of variety shows. When the monster craze hit in the 1960s, Don Post became the supplier of quality monster masks. Because of his exclusive license with Universal Studios to recreate the faces of their most famous monsters, Post's masks were a favorite of horror fans everywhere. And in 1964, when the Munsters started making those same horror fans laugh instead of scream, Post gave them masks of their favorite spooky family. But it was in 1966 that Post released his most famous series of masks, the Deluxe Universal Line. They're historically referred to as the calendar masks because of their full color debut in a calendar released that same year. Sculpted by Pat Newman, these masks remain icons of the 1960s. They appeared in magazines, on television, and even had cameos in movies. And to this day, they remain the most sought after masks by serious collectors throughout the world. Don Post Jr. had grown up at the studio. As a child, he painted the neck bolts on Frankenstein masks. And as a teenager, he helped out wherever he was needed. Well, you know, I had some plans to become a makeup artist, and uh, I was getting out of the service about 1968. At the time, my dad was 66 years old and uh, thinking of retirement, and there really wasn't anybody to uh, continue running the business. And it was very small at the time, and I said, you know, Dad, I. I think there's a lot of potential, you know, in this company. And I said, I'd like to just uh, stick around here and make masks as soon as being a makeup artist. And he says, OK, go ahead. And Don Post Jr. never looked back. Over the years, he continued in his father's footsteps, licensing the best characters from the most popular science fiction and horror movies of the day. One can only guess how many masks Don Post Studios has made over the years. Oh, it's millions and millions of masks. I, I would guess that this last year, we probably did about a million masks just in one year. So uh, you figure since 1968, um, we've probably done somewhere of a minimum of 100,000 masks a year to as many as a million masks a year over the last 25 years. So between the monsters and monkeys and madmen, only one mask has been the bestseller. Tor Johnson mask was always a very popular mask, and uh, uh, it's the mask that you see at all the football games and all, on all the NFL videos. It's always on there. And uh, I've seen it everywhere. I took my son one year to Kaminsky Park in Chicago before it closed. My father grew up in Chicago, and uh, we walk into the park. It's about the second inning. And uh, my son says, look, Dad, your mask is up on the scoreboard. Look up on this big video scoreboard, and there's Tor, Tor Johnson. And it was almost uh, some kind of cryptic message from my uh, long past father that I know you're here. And I thought the school bus drivers when I was a kid were scary. <laughs> we're in Akron, Ohio, at the Haunted Schoolhouse and the Haunted Laboratory. These are two of the best haunted houses in the country. Yes. Bob, are you ready to be scared? Oh, yeah. Let's go!
That's what I call the wave. Come to Akron, Ohio, right now. Halloween is a great time for kids. They get to dress up in costumes, you know, be a little bit creative, make their own stuff, as well as go out and there's a wide variety of masks being made out there. And it helps kids too, you know, they, uh, uh, a shy kid like myself, you know, you put on a mask and you get to act out the character and, uh, and uh, it's just a really, really fun time. Halloween, Halloween would be like I make myself up as a werewolf and I look for one kid in the neighborhood, Billy Cronin. <laughs> And if I could scare him, I knew that he would run around and tell other kids, there's a werewolf in the alley, you know? And so then I wait and I just hide, wait for the, oh, I just love to scare people, you know? And I can remember one year, uh, my rather liberal mother dressing me as Fidel Castro. And, and thinking that was rare and then getting out on the street and there was like a whole bunch of little Fidels. We could seldom afford costumes, a, a sheet uh, flung over one, oneself, an old sheet one could spare with eye holes cut. I dressed up as the wolf man. I had fun doing the vampire in London after midnight one year and uh, things like that. I, I kind of like doing the horror thing. I think it's just a family tradition. I used to go out, in fact, I remember I was Al Kaline one year because Al Kaline was my hero. And this was East Detroit in 19, in the middle, you know, early 50s. <laughs> so, I mean, he was my hero. You know, I had his number on my back and everything like that. One time I dressed up as a monster was uh, when I was nine or ten, and I'd read this magazine, Castle of Frankenstein, which is a great, great, uh, late lamented uh, monster magazine. And I'd read some article or some some, some letter in there saying, it's a great makeup tip, very cheap. Why don't spread peanut butter over your face? It kind of looks like your face is melting. So, and you have to slightly heat up the peanut butter. So I actually did that. I actually coated my face. I put on a little wig, bald cap kind of thing I got at the at Lay's 5 and 10, and went as Vincent Price melting in the House of Wax. One of the best things about our Halloween tour is that we've gotten to go all around America. And I don't think any place signifies small town United States more than Marion, Ohio. This town of about 30,000 is the home of Rob Cometti. He loved Halloween so much, every year he'd do something in his garage. It grew so big that he had to move it to downtown Marion. Here at Mucklebones Monster Museum, he's got 30 monsters of every variety. It's a wonderful place. Let's go in and take a look. Mucklebones, take one. There. Let's get back to the movies, because it's there where we find those boogeymen of the past and the boogeymen of the present, the 364 days of the year that aren't Halloween. Why do we have this fascination with macabre movies? And I, I don't know, I just had a strange fascination for them. I, I think that's why there are horror fans and people that like monsters, because they, they do look different and, and they're, they're, they're scary. And, and I think everybody really inside likes to be scared a little bit. Especially around Halloween, we all want to be scared. We all, it's a great feeling because you have, you got the chill in the air, it's fall, and, and uh, you did, you've been back to school for about two months now, and, and Halloween's a great, it's, to me, it was always one of the great holidays because uh, you, you, the perfect weather, and, and then uh, you get to go out, go trick or treating, and then, and then tr you, it's a day that you're sanctioned to scare people. And that's, that's something that, that, you know, now as a professional, you, you try to do 365 days a year. So every day is Halloween for a, a horror film director. Who are these monsters that reach out at us from the silver screen? Ostensibly, he's an alien from another dimension who plunders small town America's graveyards for dead bodies to be shipped back to his planet as slaves. But on a deeper level, I've always thought of him as a representation of death, or at least of that universal bogeyman that, that uh, haunts every child's dreams and nightmares. I think part of the thing with Freddy is that he's unrepentant. And, you know, there's all sort Wes Craven and, and all the people that followed him hid a lot of Jungian, Freudian, teenage subtext, you know. Uh, if you play naughty, Freddy will get you. And what about the men under the makeup? What kind of person does it take to make a monster come to life? 
The man was um, gentle, English, well-read, well-educated, articulate, soft-spoken, and very, very funny. He, really, he was the antithesis of the roles he played. I, when, I, when I first met Vincent, uh, we, uh, the producer and I uh, went up to, we got his address through a celebrity address service, and we, uh, script in hand, uh, like two idiots or two stalkers, we uh, go up to his house, knock on the door, and uh, lo and behold, the door opens, and there's Vincent, and uh, he's, he's in the middle of baking bread. So he, to he totally has every reason to kick us out, call the police, Etc. and to have us arrested for trespassing, uh, and he, uh, he invited us in. He was never minded being typecast. He was just grateful for being a working actor. He loved it. He was a consummate professional, and he revered uh, the monster. He treated him with respect, and he never wanted him uh, to turn into a cartoon character, as later he, in fact, was. So my dad only played the role three times. Today we're in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, riding in their Halloween parade. There's parades like this celebrating Halloween all over the country. Well, tonight we're in Bristol, Connecticut at the Witch's Dungeon Horror Museum. Now, Bob, this place has been around for 30 years. 30 years? That's a long time, man. Yeah. That's a very long time. In fact, the Witch's Dungeon Horror Museum is the longest-running Halloween exhibit in the entire country. Really? Yeah. Now, before we go inside, let's take a look at the history of this wonderful place. Yeah. It's this way, Bob. I'm looking here. No, it's over here. No, it isn't. Trust me. Okay. <laughs> Artist Cortland Hall was literally born into a monstrous family. His great uncle, Henry Hall, was the first silver screen lycanthrope in the universal classic, The Werewolf of London. Ever since I was a kid, I was fascinated by the old classic horror films when I started seeing them when I was about seven years old. And later on, I think I realized it was the artistry of the movie makeup that really uh, hooked me on them. So I wasn't satisfied with just building the model kits and having some of the posters and lobby cards. I wanted full-scale models of Boris Karloff, Lon Chaney, Bill Lugosi, Vincent Price in their classic roles. Well, Cortland had his work cut out for him. At the tender young age of 13, he started working on his dream. His mother, Dorothea, designed the costumes, and his father, Robert, helped build the dungeon itself. It took over six months of hard work to create the first six monsters. Then in October of 1966, Cortland made his final adjustments, and that Halloween, the door of the witch's dungeon was open to the public for the first time. As Cortland got older and his artistic abilities developed, he wanted to make the figures more accurate. Well, I've been very fortunate that over the years I've known John Chambers, who did the makeup in Planet of the Apes, and Dick Smith, who did the makeup in Little Big Man, Altered States, and The Exorcist, and I've learned a great deal from both of them as to recreating the classic movie monsters utilizing the original life cast. Cortland has never stopped improving the witch's dungeon. He works tirelessly on every last detail, and that effort hasn't gone unnoticed. Uh, Vincent Price took a great interest in the exhibit, as well as my artwork, and uh, Vincent gave me original voice tracks that he did for The Witch's Dungeon, as well as June Foray, who was the voice of my witch. Uh, she's best known for some of the witches that she's done in the Bugs Bunny and Donald Duck cartoons. And, of course, John Agar did a voice track for me for the Mole People and then Mark Hamill did an introduction. So everyone has been in incredibly kind and 
very much a part of the whole that has made it a tradition over the years. The Witch's Dungeon has truly become a holiday tradition for many New England families. Parents who started coming here when they were younger now bring their own children to take part in this annual scarathon. Each year, at least, we get about 1,500 people that go through, but uh, it, it's really hard to imagine how many have gone through over the 30-year period. To celebrate his 30th anniversary, Cortland invited Sarah Karloff and Ron Chaney to help with the celebration. They met with horror fans, young and old, and offered their support for this one-of-a-kind Halloween exhibit. <laughs> Welcome, poor mortal, to this witch's dungeon of nightmares. As you journey through these dark corridors, you will encounter all those ghoulies, ghosties, and long-legged beasties that go bump in the night. Beware, and gather up all your courage, for we are about to begin. <laughs> you put a costume on a kid and it brings out the happiness in them. They can be monsters or clowns or whatever. It really sort of made, it freed you up as a child and, and, uh, and, and really sort of served the imagination. Kids love to play with masks, they love to play with makeup, they love to play with costumes. All kids are natural actors. What I, what I do professionally is only what kids do for kicks at, at, at Halloween. Now, Halloween for children is wonderful. My only objection to it was that it wasn't a national holiday and we had to go back to school the next day. I think what happened is the boomer generation, which I am unfortunately part of demographically, remembers it with such fondness and remembers the innocence of it so well that we don't want to give it up. Alvarez Wax Studios in Long Beach, California supplies meticulously detailed wax figures for museums all over the world. Although famous for his historical subjects, Henry Alvarez's true passion is monsters. I used to stay up, sneak up, uh, uh, and watch the, uh, the old uh, classic monster movies, Frankenstein, The Wolfman, and Dracula, and that was, it was a great thrill to be able to you know, sneak into the living room and turn it on and keep it low so the parents didn't hear. Over the years, Henry has sculpted for special effects master Rob Bottin on many horror films, including The Thing and The Witches of Eastwick. And he remains one of the most sought after independent Halloween mask designers in the country. I started working for Catherine Stuberg, Stuberg Studios, uh, on October 31st, 1968. And that was the beginning of my career, which has led up to all this. Whether it's masks, bronzes, paintings or figures, the talented artist at Alvarez Wax Studios never fail to give us the creeps. Frosty nights with a hint of snow and the long bony fingers of the oak tree scratching against the window, trying to get in to bring with them one shuddered to imagine. I remember Halloween as a chance to go out with the older guys and get into a little bit of mischief. But as a child, I don't remember trick-or-treating. We used to do uh, um, rather quainter things. Uh, Bob Apple and Duck Apple is what I remember doing. We used to hang apples on a string and then you'd try and take a bite out of it or put apples in a bowl of water and plunge your head into the water and try and come up with an apple. It was, it was different. We had to make our own fun. I remember we used to take a uh, a, a spool from, from a, a spool of thread uh, and cut little notches uh, in, the, in the edges and then put a pencil inside and run it down a glass window of a neighbor's home to make this sudden shocking sound. Halloween to me was a big, big time. I liked it better than Christmas for me. Bob Burns is certainly no stranger to Halloween. In big fact, big many of his earliest memories involve costumes and makeup. When I was seven years old, I decided I wanted to be the wolf man. I had never played with makeup stuff in my life before, and my mom had sort of a wig piece or something, I think you used to call them buns or something, that you put the back of her head, a little hair thing. I took it apart and cut all the hairs and got all the hairs, and I decided I was going to glue them on my face. I didn't know what to use, so I used white glue, which is not the greatest thing I found to use on the face. And I glued all this stuff on, and then I got shoe polish and painted my face sort of a dark brown and all this stuff with the wolf nose type thing and all that. 
And what I didn't seem to realize, there were two points. Number one, I should have never cut my mom's uh, wiglet up, or what do you want to call it? She was not happy at all. Number two, I couldn't get the white glue off for about a week, and I looked a little bit strange going to school that way, I want to tell you. Thankfully, now, his mother's understandable school. reaction didn't stifle young Bob's enthusiasm for monsters. He continued to experiment with different makeups. Now, you might wonder why a nice, normal kid likes monsters so much. Oh, I think I've always liked monsters. Uh, for one thing, I just think they're really cool. Uh, they were different. Uh, they were different from, from people I knew. And in fact, I think I got to love monsters more than I did people, to be honest with you. Bob eventually met up with low-budget special effects wizard Paul Blaisdell, who allowed the young fan to assist him on many sci-fi classics, including the She-Creature and Invasion of the Saucer Men. Then adulthood finally came knocking for Bob in the form of a draft notice, and the little boy who liked to play soldier had to become one. Bob was assigned to Brook Army Medical Center, where he got to put his makeup knowledge to use creating realistic battle wounds for Army training films. While stationed in Texas, he also found time to create the monsters for a local version of Shock Theater. After returning to Los Angeles, Bob hooked back up with longtime friend Paul Blaisdell and together they created Fantastic Monsters magazine. In the mid-70s, Bob starred with Forrest Tucker and Larry Storch in the Saturday morning favorite, Ghostbusters. But it was through a magazine cover story in 1978 when the man who made the monsters and played the monkeys became the godfather of Halloween to sci-fi fans all over the world. And I wanted to show kids Halloween could still be real fun. So I used to just put on a mask, one of the masks I had, and, and have my wife open the door real slowly, and I would just Bleh. And these kids in the neighborhood got a real kick out of it and said, wow, there's this, this weirdo down the street that puts this mask on. We got to go see him. And that's how it actually started. And all the kids told the other kids, and da 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 and it just kept going and, and kept growing. So the first one I ever did was, I think, in 1967. And uh, Glenn Strange, who played the Frankenstein monster in, in three of the films, including Abbott Costello, was like my second dad. He was very close. And I decided to do a Frankenstein monster lab in my living room and have the people look through the door and see it and all this type of stuff. So I created a table and I had a mask, a uh, Don Post mask I'd poured up myself of Glenn as the monster and made a dummy from that and had the dummy on the table. I had a Jacob's Ladder thing I'd made up that shoots big sparks all over the place. And Glenn actually came over to see it and I have this wonderful shot of him standing by himself on the table, which was a, just a real thrill for me that Glenn would come over and see it. So that was my first real set, you might say, getting into the Halloween stuff. Soon after that, Bob's friends started offering their help. Friends like future Academy Award winner Dennis Murin and Disney Imagineer Tommy Sherman. Needless to say, the shows would become much more elaborate and uh, we decided to do a, a takeoff on This Island Earth. And I had the mutant head from This Island Earth, a casting of that. So my wife made this sort of silver lame costume thing. And Tommy and, and Dennis built this great thing here again inside the house of the interior of the spaceship uh, from, well, say, This Island Earth or something like that. The following year, Bob's house was invaded by a Goomba. This huge one-eyed tentacle creature broke through the roof and wreaked havoc on the unlucky inhabitants. Next, the Halloween crew decided it was time for a trip to the doctor's office. Dr. Jekyll, that is. This time, they transformed the house into a mad scientist lab. Then Bob used an old but effective lighting trick to transform into the evil Mr. Hyde right in front of the trick-or-treater's eyes. And then after that, my wife decided she was going to throw us outside because uh, we, the living room couldn't take any more stuff. So we went in the backyard, which turned out to be the best thing we ever did. And I'm the only living human being that's ever gone in the cage with this here gorilla. So the next the year, they transformed the backyard into a jungle down. compound for Kogar Escapes. In this show that he used to perform at Magic Mountain Amusement Park, Bob, wearing his favorite gorilla suit, learned to respect authority. I'll put it in front of his fierce and ugly face for you once more, and he'll come to the back of the cage like a small child. Look at that. Now for the next show, since we were outside anyway, uh, we decided to do something rather different and rather scary, actually. Rick Baker had just finished working on The Exorcist with Dick Smith, and we thought, wow, that might be a fun thing to tackle. So we came up with a title called The Thing in the Attic, which is supposed to be about a possessed girl uh, in this attic that looked a little like uh, the gal in The Exorcist. Rick Baker did a masterful job recreating Dick Smith's horrifying makeup. No detail was ignored. The show used two girls because of the strenuous levitating effect. 
That's Bob's ever-patient wife, Kathy, as one of the possessed girls. Well, you know what they say. Two heads are better than one. He thinks the girl's insane that I don't possess her. <laughs> Creatures of the night assist me on this all hallows eve. I command you, appear to me, appear to me now, now, now! Now, as Bob's shows continued to grow, so did the army of volunteers needed to create these extravaganzas. Well, there was a lot of people that worked on the shows, a lot of very talented people, and I'm just blessed with a lot of friends who just uh, happened to be some of the best special effects uh, people and writers and creative people in the business. We had Rick Baker, Dennis Murin, uh, Doug Beswick, D.C. Fontana, Bob and Denny Skotek, Mike Miner, Tom Sherman. Oh, the list goes on and on and on and on. And so did the Halloweens. The crew built the planet of Altair IV in the backyard for the Forbidden Planet Show. Robbie the Robot even stopped by for a cameo. When Bob became the proud owner of the original time machine, it took one last trip into the future before being permanently displayed in the Bob Burns Museum. And in a wonderful tribute to H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, they crashed a Martian spaceship into Bob's house. And you know those Martians are never friendly. By the time Bob and his crew performed their last show, a trip down the Amazon in search of the creature from the Black Lagoon, they had scared thousands and thousands of people every Halloween for 15 years. That's a lot of screams. I think it was just some of the most fun stuff I've ever done in my entire life, and I'm proud of them. I'm usually gone on Halloween. Uh, uh, it's very lucrative time of year for me, yet guess why. And uh, so I'm usually off doing a public appearance somewhere or a talk show. Uh, or, uh, you know, maybe a, a haunted house somewhere or an amusement park. People never come to my door. It's really weird. I don't think I've ever had anybody come to the door. Well, I have two big rattlesnakes on the door, you know, and uh, there's a big gate out front, and I'm afraid, you know, they're probably afraid that, you know, our house is sort of like the Adams family. There's always like a cloud over our house, you know, and there's a thunder. <laughs> my father always referred to Halloween as his busy season. He did a lot of guest appearances on television, spooking his own boogeyman image. And um, we're finding it to be the same. We do a lot of interviews and a lot of personal appearances at Halloween. It's a lot of fun. Well, a few, a few years I've celebrated Halloween by uh, forgetting to buy candy and <laughs> turning out my lights. It would be very strange for me if I opened my door one Halloween night and found Pinhead on the doorstep demanding a trick or treat. I'd give him the trick. <laughs> Well, today we're in Berlin, Massachusetts at Spooky World, America's only horror theme park. Now, I realize the place doesn't look too scary right now, but when the moon comes out, this place is spooktacular.
A spooky world. America's horror at me, boy. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed being scared as much as we enjoyed scaring you. On behalf of all of us here, have a happy and safe Halloween. Happy Halloween. Happy, happy Halloween. Hello, kitties. I'm Alice Cooper. Eat lots and lots of candy. And remember, I know where you live. From the Witch's Dungeon Horror Museum, have a happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween! <laughs> and I wish you a happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween from all of the Cheneys to everybody. Have a very safe and happy Halloween. Hi, I'm Erin Murphy. I was Tabitha on Bewitched. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Robert England here, AKA Freddy Krueger, wishing you a <laughs> happy Halloween.